John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. As he writes over on our website, 97.3 ESPN.com, the NFL Draft has a new home. We'll get into that in just a second. Not a whole heck of a lot of Eagles stuff today. We'll dive into some of the Eagles news that there is out there. Also, a lot of the NFL news and notes. Don't forget, you can check out John, his national column, FanRag Sports NFL, and follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen on Twitter. And he joins us each and every day at this time on 97.3 ESPN. John, so it looks like the NFL draft has a new home. And of all the places it could go to, if you're going to leave Philadelphia, you can't turn your back on Philly and go to Dallas. (laughs) Well, yeah, I I mean, this has been rumored for a while. Kind of one of those things that was a wink-wink behind the scenes. And it was confirmed today that uh, the Cowboys in in Dallas uh, will be hosting the draft at AT AT&T Stadium. You know, this is what the NFL envisioned uh, by sort of taking this on the road and, and having a, a mini Super Bowl type of thing where cities would bid for it and it would move around uh, from year to year. Took it out of New York. They spent two years in Chicago. So I think some people looked at that and said maybe Philadelphia had a chance because they did such a, a wonderful job. Uh, and they'll get it again because of the job they did. But the league would prefer to to move it around, and, and, and that's sort of a nod towards this. And I say to the city of Philadelphia, you know, look at the bright side and the fact that there's no way Dallas can live up to what Philadelphia did this year. Brought a lot of money into the city. How about the job they did with that? You said it could be coming back, but I know Jeffrey Lurie has wanted a Super Bowl. The way they handled the draft – do you think that would give them any shot down the road for a Super Bowl or not having an indoor stadium really precludes them from being a, a legitimate Super Bowl host? Yeah, I, Jeffrey kind of talked about that last time he spoke. I think it was a, a little underreported because there were so many more controversial issues. Uh, but, you know, he did not sound very optimistic uh, as far as getting a Super Bowl. Uh, the NFL does it, and, and they did it in New York a couple of years ago in an open-air stadium. Uh, it's in Minneapolis this year, but obviously they have a brand-new stadium that's indoors. Uh, I, I, I think if it was indoors, they'd have a better chance, no question about that. Uh, I think they kind of missed out. I think maybe the first four or five years, uh, Lincoln Financial Field was open, and, and it was new, and it was state-of-the-art. I think there would have been a better opportunity at that point. It's going to be really, really difficult uh, for Philadelphia to ever get a Super Bowl. Uh, It's in Minnesota this year, by the way, and uh, they got the brand new stadium there. I know it seems like they just got a new stadium, but we see these new stadiums all over the place. Do you think that uh, Lincoln Financial Field has, uh, what's the shelf life on that place? Well, that's a good question. I I mean, the shelf life on these things, uh, especially you know, I, I understand when people get upset when there's subsidies for these stadiums because they cost so much money and there's so few dates and they are sort of uh, out of, you know, Lincoln Financial Field's a perfect example because, it, as I said, when it first opened, it was state-of-the-art, and now people look at it and say, ah, oh, that's just a, an average stadium when you see Minneapolis and Atlanta just opened and you see AT&T Stadium. Uh, and the new uh, Los Angeles Stadium, which has already got a Super Bowl in the future, uh, yeah, you fall behind really quickly. And uh, we'll see if it ever stops. Uh, I mean, the shelf life on these things should be longer than it is. I'll just say that. John McMullen, 97.3ESPN.com. Uh, today was the uh, NFL owners expressing – uh, their disbelief that players should stand for the national anthem in meetings. They, they focus, though, on how the league can address the concerns of the players uh, who were protesting it. Roger Goodell spoke today. He noted that uh, only a handful of players are currently protesting league-wide and said that, really, they're going to continue to work to make that number down, but they're not going to force them. Uh, what did you take from some of the stuff that Goodell had to say today in regards to how that meeting went uh, with the players? Yeah, I mean, I saw a guy who was straddling the fence or attempting to. Uh, there's no question about it. He said, you should stand for the national anthem, but they're not going to force anybody to stand for the national anthem. And 
I, I think they sort of took the temperature uh, behind the scenes uh, of what would happen if they forced it upon the players, and, and they kind of saw that exploding the controversy even further. Uh, so they pulled back on that, and that's what you see sort of uh, developing uh, is is somebody trying to, to serve two masters, and it's very, very difficult to do that. I, I think the mistake was original, uh, and, and if the league wanted players to stand for the national anthem, they should have done it immediately. They should have said, look, we understand your concerns. There are other ways to go about this. We'll work with you. But for this particular, because of our business and because of our brand, we need you to do this. I I think it would have went over a little bit better, but that's not what they did. So, John, is it, I mean, did the league attempt to talk to some of the guys that are been protesting and say, listen, kind of meet us halfway here? I mean, is that something that was discussed at all? Oh, sure. Uh, You know, Malcolm uh, Jenkins and, and, uh, a number of the Eagles met with Roger Goodell here in Philadelphia uh, at the Novacare complex before the NFL meeting. Uh, and, and a number of players were up there uh, this week uh, on, on Tuesday and today uh, speaking with the commissioner and people around the league. So there's been those talks uh, behind the scenes. It's interesting. You know, I, I've mentioned before uh, Donald Trump spoke out on this, it, it was – Less than 1% of the players were protesting the national anthem. Less than 1% of NFL players were uh, doing something other than standing uh, at attention for the national anthem. So at that point, it was sort of an overblown uh, manufactured controversy by, uh, you know, the 24-7 news cycle and, and CNN and Fox and all those competing entities. Uh, and then when the president spoke out, it exploded a little bit more. Uh, then when Jerry Jones and Stephen Roth uh, tried to uh, implement rules for their particular teams, it exploded a little bit more. And now it's out of control. And the NFL, as usual, is behind the curve. And very reactive organization, very rarely proactive. John, now you have the situation with Colin Kaepernick and filing a grievance and all of this mess. Is this only going to kind of blow this controversy up to another level? Uh, did, did Colin kind of put himself into a situation where he's not going to be in the league at all, you know, anytime soon? Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's so many different issues with Colin Kaepernick and nobody really has a beat, no matter what they say, nobody has a beat on it because nobody understands his thought process because he really hasn't explained it. Uh, So from a football standpoint, uh, you know, this probably ends it for him filing this grievance. He's he's certainly not going to be back this season. He may never be back Uh, before this. You know, we never really got an indication of what he wanted. Did he want to be a starter? Some people say that. Some people say he didn't. Did he want a lot of money? Some people say he did. Some people said he'd be willing uh, to play for the veteran minimum and accept a backup role. We don't really know. John, is this, did he go into this following this saying, I look, there's, I know I'm never going to be in the league again, so I have nothing to lose. Well, the grievance part of it, you can argue that from his standpoint, and and that could be his thinking. Uh, I I don't I never believe that. Uh, I I think he had workouts before Seattle, probably the closest to where uh, would have been a fit for him uh, to play again. I think as injuries started to pile up, uh, there would have been opportunities for him uh, down the line. But, yeah, from his standpoint, he can certainly think that. Uh, I think a lot of people have sort of given, put that into his head, that he's being banned from this league. I I don't think there's any question about that. And I think on a personal level, he probably believes that. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm talking to Jeffrey Lurie himself, who's, uh, as I constantly point out, is a very – progressive guy explained when I asked the question, explained, that's just not how this league works. 
Nobody from Park Avenue is telling Jeffrey Lurie not to sign Colin, Colin Kaepernick. It just didn't happen. Uh, and and there are a number of, of teams, I think, that would have been uh, desirous to have him play in certain situations. Uh, but then the ancillary stuff comes into it, and, and that has certainly made it more difficult for him. So from his standpoint, yes, I believe he thinks he's banned from this league. Yeah, and obviously, as we've talked about, that it is very hard to prove collusion. Uh, but if you file against the league, you know, are you doing it for publicity? Are you doing it to further your protest? I mean, you would have to think, as much as many of us say that's very hard and don't think that he really has a shot here, you would have to think he thinks he possesses some sort of evidence, right? Um, I can't say he doesn't. And, I don't have access and that to you it. would benefit by an arbitrator being outside of the NFL circles here. Yeah, I, I, I mean it's very unlikely that he has any. You know, there's no, there's not going to be any smoking gun mm-hmm. as far as a memo. And I think Mark Garagos, as a lawyer, is a very high profile guy, uh, has had a lot of high profile cases. Uh, everything from murder cases down to, to anything involving Hollywood. Right. Uh, he, he's very, you know, smart in these types of things. And he, he pointed out his original thing, even the intimation of collusion uh, can indicate collusion. I think that speaks volume. There is no smoking gun here. I, I mean, you can say whatever you want about Roger Goodell, but even if you want to stipulate he wants to ban this guy from this league. And again, I, I think that's ludicrous. He's not dumb enough to write a memo. And uh, as I always point out with conspiracy theorists, it, you have to look at the conspiracy. You have to really un- and say, okay, you know, perhaps Jerry Jones, perhaps Robert Kraft and, and, and their politics that lean right, maybe they would be on board with something like that. But why would Jeffrey Lloyd, why would Jed York, why would Paul Allen, who are tremendously progressive in their politics, why would they be on board with that? It it just doesn't make sense at a base level. John, I've been on Colin's side for a lot of this whole situation, Um, but this just, it, it doesn't make sense to me because when you look at it, if he wins this, I mean, they're not going to – a judge can't rule you to go back into the NFL. He can't make these owners sign you. I just – the more I look at this, the more I'm thinking, okay, he's just decided that his football career is over and he's trying to do it for pride or whatever the case may be. Because if this was strictly football, this is just something you don't do. No, I, I think he's doing it for legacy purposes. And I think his hope is huh. – you know, if he wins this case, the entire collective bargaining uh, agreement would be overturned, and, and then he would become this almost legendary figure in, in league annals. But it's just, uh, it, it, it's an unwinnable case. It's an unwinnable grievance. And I think a lot of people, the casual fans say, and I talk about this with Mike a lot, they'll say, well, he's one of the best 64 quarterbacks in the world. Uh, and he is. There's no question about that. Uh, but they, they assume just because of that, that it's collusion, that he should have a job. And specifically, specifically in the CBA, it says, look, we all know there are other reasons. And I explained this earlier in the week on the show where certain guys will make a team and certain guys will not. It usually has to do with contract type situations. Maybe a veteran makes a lot of money and you want to go cheaper at that type of position. Uh, but the veterans better. Uh, it might be a young rookie, as I pointed out here with Danelle Pumphrey and Shelton Gibson, who didn't deserve to make this 53-man roster, but they did. Right. But as I pointed out, you know, Bryce Treggs is arguing collusion. That's just part of football. So you can't argue that Jerry Jones doesn't want to sign Colin Kaepernick because he, he kneeled during the national anthem. Even if you prove that, that is not collusion. Right. You can I think surmise, you can surmise that. that Jerry Jones doesn't want to sign you for that reason, but you might not be able to surmise that Jeffrey Lurie chose not to. Well, exactly. Right. Because and that's why I certainly collusion. believe that there are 
numerous organizations that want nothing him to do with him because of that, and others who just don't need him, and others who just are indifferent and say, you know what, we have what we have, and we're okay with what we have. You're not a tremendous upgrade over what we have. Bingo. Uh, there are, I would say, more than half of these organizations don't want to sign Colin Kaepernick because uh, of his stance and his activism. And people can be disgusted by that. And, and that's I, I their right, by the way. Them. I would support them, yeah. Uh, but it's not collusion. That's, uh, that's their right, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, they're a private organization. Uh, they can take things into account on whether they want to hire a potential employee. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this with Mike McCarthy because everyone said, you know, Aaron Rodgers goes down. Uh, Colin's a, a Milwaukee native. It makes so much sense uh, on, a, on a base level that he would go to the Packers. And, you know, these are people who know nothing about the NFL, who know nothing about how Ted Thompson runs his team. He doesn't want free agents. He doesn't sign free agents. He signs one every three years. He likes to build from within. They've had Brett Hundley for three years. They've had Joe Callahan now for two years, and they're going to move forward. And people look at Mike McCarthy and automatically throw some charged words at him, uh, whatever you want to call him, whether you want to call him a racist, a bigot, whatever you want to call him. That, to me, is so completely unfair, so completely uh, off the case. But it tells you what a polarized society we have. Yeah. And it's just, you know, people assume these things, and it's like, yeah, Mike McCarthy wants to win games. And by the way, look at Brett, look at the U of Brett Hundley's skin. It doesn't make sense. But people are on both sides of the fence, and they refuse to move. Uh, we'll obviously see more of what happens from the owners' meetings. Anything else happened at the owners' meetings today there, John? <laughs> <laughs> nothing nothing that, that generated uh, any media interest, and certainly, I, I think from a business standpoint, the larger concern is is television ratings, and they continue uh, to go down seven percent uh, at this stage. And I think a lot of people were hopeful uh, that the presidential election was the reason uh, the ratings were going down, but they continue to go down, and, and a lot of people are tying that. Right, seven. What is it? Seven percent. They're down this year. Seven percent. Yeah. And by the way, I think it has nothing to do with protests. I think it has to do with TV in general. SEC ratings uh, on CBS are down 30%. That's just people aren't watching as much well, TV. Well, the, the as NFL they did. is hurting its own product. We we're just uh, you know talking off the air. Everybody watches the Red Zone. I don't, but a lot of people do. I mean, the fact that the NFL puts that on hurts their own product. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Red Zone is one of those things. Again, you're trying to serve so many masters because there's so many fantasy football players that enjoy Red Zone. And, yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I, I think you have a whole generation. And I say with baseball even more. I, I mean, if you want to watch, I know I, I have so many friends who want, want to watch the American League Championship Series. And nobody has FS1. <laughs> it's like <laughs> if you're Major League Baseball, and hey, if somebody gives you the check, you say, "Great, we're going to take it to the bank, and we're going to we're we're smiling ear to ear." But if people can't see your product, and, and then they also have because uh, I think a younger generation, to be honest, has a shorter attention span. They have a very difficult time sitting for a three-hour NFL game. Never mind a four four-hour baseball playoff game. I think that enters into it as well. Uh, he's John McMullen. You can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. And, of course, uh, check out his national column at FanRag Sports NFL and all his Eagles coverage at 97.3 ESPN.com. Tomorrow we'll have uh, plenty more on the Eagles and the Redskins as they get ready for their Monday nighter. And, of course, every day here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN and the new 97.3 ESPN.com app. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you, guys.